visiting with us. We appreciate so much you doing so. We would ask if you would fill out a visitor's card in the seat back in front of you, and later on the services, we'll pass those to the center aisle and, and collect those. Uh, it's a beautiful day. It's good to see some uh, faces that we haven't seen in a long time, and it's a historic day here at Walter Hill. Uh, a couple months ago, uh, well, back in April, we had Paul's 25th anniversary with Walter Hill, and today will be uh, sort of the final day in the pulpit as the full-time pulpit minister uh, for Brother Paul. And so uh, we, it's a special day, and we've got, uh, after worship services, uh, we'll have some classes in Adult 1, 2, and down the hall. And then our auditorium will be transformed into a fellowship hall, and we'll, we'll have a fellowship meal and reception on behalf of Brother Paul. So. Uh, we're so thankful for uh, his time as the pulpit minister here at Walter Hill. Uh, we've been very blessed, and we will continue to be blessed as Brother Paul uh, serves in the capacity of associate minister. So uh, it's an uh, exciting day. I know for Brother Paul it's exciting. <laughs> uh, it's exciting for all of us, but we're just so thankful that Brother Paul is going to uh, be around. So it won't be his last time in the pulpit. Um, so we're, we're excited about today. So uh, if you would, let's all stand as we read from God's Word and we sing our first two songs. Titus chapter 3, starting in verse 4. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Let's all sing. Lord, I let your name on That'll help everyone be able to find a seat. Our next song this morning will be number 275. I love to tell the story. We'll sing the first, second, and fourth verses. <clears throat>
sing number 17, All People That on Earth Do Dwell. We'll sing the first three verses. <laughs> pray together. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning grateful and thankful for another day, another chance for us to, to assemble together as a church family and sing songs of praise to you and to pray to you and present our, our petitions, our needs, and our gratefulness, and another chance to hear more from your word, Lord. And, and hopefully we grow spiritually from that. And we're just so grateful, Lord, so many things that, that we have to be thankful for. Uh, but now at this time, we want to ask that, that you would be with those of our number that are sick, that, that couldn't be here, that you know, they have procedures or recoveries. We just pray that you'll be with them, be with uh, all the medical personnel that would be attending to them, be with their families and provide comfort. We pray that you'll also be with those of our number who might be mourning right now or going through a particularly hard time and that we would um, always lift them up in prayer and, and Lord, that you would comfort them in only the ways that you can. We also want to ask a special blessing over those of our number who are expectant mothers or parents to be and we just pray that you'll, you'll be with them and um, and then watch over them. Lord, we pray for our, our nation. We pray for the leaders of our nation at all levels, that you would be with them, that they would seek you for your wisdom, that they would go to your word and, and see what it is that, that you would have them to do, that they would consider always what is good for, for the people as it relates to, to your will, Lord. We also pray for the, for the world as well, Lord, a world that um, not everyone knows you, not everyone at times wants to know you, and we just pray that hearts are changed. We pray for those out in the mission field, that you would be with them, that you would give them the strength and the boldness that they need to proclaim your word. We pray that you would be with us, as we go out into the world, as we take what we know to be true, we take your word that we would not be afraid to share that, that you would give us boldness and strength. Lord, we are especially thankful for, for the church. We're thankful that we've had a, a very long-lived minister in the pulpit here. We pray that... Um, the new minister, that he would have the same tenure that, that um, he would bring your word in a way that, that we can receive it and we can grow from it. And we just we thank you for that blessing, Lord, that there are still people out there that are willing to, to preach the word full time. And we just we thank you for that, Lord. 
And we pray that as we worship this morning, as we assemble together, that, that again, we have open hearts, open ears, that we just remember everything that you've done for us, Lord. We pray that as we fail you continually, Lord, that, that we would recognize that, learn from that, and, and try to always, always be better, try to always be the, the examples that you need us to be, Lord. But we're so grateful for your son and the forgiveness that, that we have through him. We ask that you just continue to watch over us today, Lord, and it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. The scripture reading this morning is from Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. In your few Bibles, that will be on page 886. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs. And no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains. And the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. For our offering, we'll sing the first, fourth, and sixth verses of number 613, Take My Life and Let It Be. Take my life. Shall we pray? Our loving and merciful Father in heaven, what manner of love it is that we might be called your children. Our minds cannot fully comprehend the depth of your love for us. We cannot begin to count the many blessings, both spiritual and physical, that you have provided for us and continue to provide. We pray, Father, that as we reflect upon those blessings, that we are motivated to give generously, willingly, cheerfully, and purposefully. We ask your blessings on these gifts as we give them this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
preparation for the Lord's Supper, we'll sing in Christ alone. It's not in our books, but we'll be projected on the screen. And immediately following communion, we'll sing the first and third verses of number 450, Nearer My God to Thee. In Christ alone. If anyone needs the communion set, would you raise your hand and it will be brought to you? All right. Never again. You probably have heard that this year. Uh, that phrase is associated uh, most often with the Holocaust. Many Holocaust memorials feature that phrase as a challenge to the world to not allow such a thing to happen again. It has been shared by politicians and writers and used a number of ways, uh, but especially this year with the Ukraine uh, conflict, it has been uh, discussed many times. Time will tell whether the world will prevent such things from happening again. But our Heavenly Father, in effect, said never again uh, to something else many, many years before. Hebrews 10 tells us that the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. And I want to share pieces of about three verses from Hebrews 10 that in essence are God saying never again, never again. In verse 10, we read, By that will, by the will of God, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Never again. In verse 12, 
But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. And then verse 14, for by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Never again does our Savior have to be sacrificed. Never again do we have to bear the full penalty of sin because of what he has done for us. And he instituted this memorial feast so that we might remember and proclaim that sacrifice, proclaim his death as often as we do this in remembrance of him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for the sacrifice that you've made of your son for the forgiveness of our sins, that he has paid the price through his body. As we partake of this bread, we pray that we do remember the sacrifice, remember his suffering, and remember the depth of your love for us and our need for a Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue. Father, we continue to remember. We're so thankful for the precious blood of Jesus, which he shed so willingly in obedience to you. Showing his obedience, showing his love for us, his willingness to give his precious blood that our sins might be forgiven, that we might stand righteous before you. We're thankful for the privilege of being your children, of being in your church, and we pray that we do indeed proclaim his death as a church until he comes again. In Jesus' name, amen.
next song this morning will be number 184, God is the Fountain Winds. God is the Fountain song this morning. It will be number 781. We'll sing the first of the, all three verses of that at the close of the lesson. Now before the lesson we'll sing number 543, Redeemed. If it's convenient for you, would you please stand? <clears throat> Sweet is the soul Once again, we want to express our welcome to everyone, especially if you're visiting with us. We're thankful that you're here with us on this Lord's Day. We want to also welcome our online viewers. I have a lot of mixed emotions today, uh, a lot of things I could say uh, as I look out over the audience and uh, see so many who've uh, encouraged me along the way who I've watched mature and grow in Christ. 
uh, so many things like that as I look out. I would be remiss, though, if I failed to mention, when I first started here, uh, Brian Bowman led the singing, and he led for so many years, and then Matt has taken over. Uh, a song leader makes my job uh, either successful or a failure, really. Uh, it's not so much the preaching, it's the preparation of the song service that has such an impact. And, and both of these men have done a wonderful job. And so I, I offer my thanks to, to both of you for, for your years of service of leading us in song. We had a great trip, but we are thankful to be home safe and sound. Uh, so thankful to be back uh, in our own beds. I like pork. Some of you have heard me say I never met a pig I didn't like. <laughs> I just love pork. Uh, all kinds, um, however it's fixed, I love it. And so with tongue in cheek, I say that our text this morning has a tragic side to it with the loss of all that bacon. But seriously, as my last sermon as the full-time minister at Walter Hill, what I want to say, the sermon of my 25th anniversary focused on the cross. I, I honestly don't know what is in store for us today, except that we're going to have a meal together and there's a slideshow. Um, Gail and I do not like to be first in line. We don't like the spotlight on us. But we talked about it on the way here. We'll, we'll try to be gracious and grateful for the attention showed us today. We are here to worship God and study His Word. So I've reworked a sermon that I preached some 14 years ago. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The title of my lesson is When Pigs Fly. It's a well-known saying of unknown origin. They say that around Cincinnati, there are many uh, figurines and statues uh, related to this little adage. It is told that when hogs were delivered from one side of the river to the slaughterhouse on the other side, they were loaded on top of flat barges. And as they stood on the barges and they moved across the river, sometimes the fog would, would rise up, over the, up above the water and cover the bottom of the barge. And it would look like the pigs were floating on air as they moved across the river. It gave the appearance that they were flying. And this legend is the inspiration behind this flying pig sculpture in the Cincinnati airport. This adage is known in several languages, even using different animals, but the basic meaning is that it describes an event that will never occur. And I use it as a title of the lesson this morning in hopes that we can change the meaning, change the meaning based upon this incredible story from the New Testament. I hope you'll open your Bibles as we study this demon-possessed man. And as always here at Walter Hill, we urge you to be like the Brins in Acts 17, 11, and search your Bibles daily to make sure that we're preaching and teaching the truth from God's holy word. We're taking our text from the Gospel of Mark this morning, although the account is found in all three synoptic Gospels. Is found in Matthew 8, verses 28 through 34, and also in Luke chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. Various texts that, that we find where it's recorded list the site of this miracle basically in three different places. 
as the country of the Gergesenes, uh, pointed there its modern day Kersey. Uh, many years ago, I was able to uh, go and, and visit that place. Uh, the country of the Gadarenes, a little further south to the uh, southeast at the bottom of the Sea of Galilee, and then further south in the country of the Gerasenes. Now, something could be said in favor of all three of those locations, but pinpointing the exact locations on a map is near to impossible. However, there's a reference made to the region of the Decapolis or the Ten Cities made in Mark chapter 5, verse 20, that would indicate that the miracle actually took place near the city of Gadara on the southern end of the Sea of Galilee. And contrary to the proportions that are shown on this particular map, this town does have a port on the Sea of Galilee. Also, the writings of Josephus and others confirmed that the Sea of Galilee at, once, at, at one time uh, had been fuller with a shoreline closer to the cliffs than shown in this modern photo. And, and, and here you can see there's quite a distance between the cliffs and the shoreline there, which makes, as we read this story, uh, how did those pigs jump off the cliff into the water. Well, uh, maybe Josephus is right. At one time, uh, if it occurred in this location, the Sea of Galilee moved closer to those cliffs. There's another problem area uh, in that Matthew refers to two demon-possessed men, and Mark and Luke only have one. Uh, this could be explained as one being more pronounced than the other, one of the, the demoniacs being more um, uh, outgoing, more prominent in the story than the other. Um, Matthew presents both men, but Mark and Luke, uh, maybe they see only this one as standing out uh, in the story, and they omit the other uh, because he remains in the background. But I got to thinking about it. You know, the same thing happens with the story of blind Bartimaeus. Uh, in Mark chapter 10, we have the blind Bartimaeus being healed. Mark and Luke only have one blind man. Matthew has two. Matthew has two. Maybe the same inference can be made that uh, in the story of Bartimaeus, he's the one who stands out prominently in the story rather than the other. And with that brief commentary, I want us to look at the account from Mark's gospel. For some reason, Jesus had decided to escape the crowds there in Capernaum and to go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. So Matthew 8, 18 says that Jesus commanded his disciples uh, to go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And it's during this voyage as they move across the Sea of Galilee that the storm comes up and Jesus is sleeping in the boat and the disciples think, Lord, wake up, we're drowning. And, and they want him to save them. And Jesus gets up and calms the storm. What a great miracle. After calming the storm, maybe the next morning, Jesus and his disciples arrive on the far shore. And as Jesus gets out of the boat, he's welcomed by this man, a guy who lived in the cemetery. And apparently every time they had to tr tried to have a funeral there at the cemetery, uh, they would try to, to put this man in chains and to calm him down, but he would only break the chains. And we can only imagine the horrible sounds that this man made as he cried and he cut himself with, with rocks and stones. So picking up our text in verse 6, the man ran toward Jesus and he fell down and he, he worshiped him. Now let's see what the Holy Spirit says in verses 7 through 12. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? 
And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine that we may enter them. You know, as we reflect upon the story up to this point, we can understand how the man broke the chains. He was possessed by many demons, not just one. Well, most of you know the story that Jesus gave permission for the demons or the unclean spirits to enter into the herd of swine. A herd that numbered some 2,000. That's a lot of pigs. That's a lot of pigs. Does that mean there were 2,000 demons possessing that man? But Jesus gave them permission, and the herd then ran violently down the steep hills or the cliffs into the sea and drowned. Now, I don't know about you, but I can only imagine the shock of those pig herders as they watched all the pork go into the sea. Here they heard, just a few minutes ago, they were watching over these pigs as they rooted around for something to eat, and now they're gone. Now they're gone. And bad news travels fast, and these men rushed into town to relay what had happened. And it's probably the most exciting thing that ever happened in the town of Gadara. The people rushed out of the city to see what had happened. Verses 15 through 17. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind. Kind of strikes a blow against nudism sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed. They were afraid. Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. Well, the one thing we don't know is, it, is it because of the loss of the pigs? Or is it because they feared this man who could heal someone who was demon-possessed? But these folks wanted Jesus to get out of their country. And you're probably wondering at this point, where are you going with this lesson? I want us to pause for just a moment and do some serious soul searching. Some serious soul searching. And I'm going to step on my toes as well as yours. Over the past 25 years, we have had some evangelistic moments here at Walter Hill. We have had some themes, and we have had some lessons, and we have had some classes and other efforts to reach the lost. We've done some good work taking the gospel to the lost around the world. And Walter Hill's to be commended for going to Uganda and Nigeria and Honduras and El Salvador. but we still haven't set the woods on fire in reaching the lost of our community. Will we, will we just continue in this slothful pattern and beg God's forgiveness when we run out of time? 
Each of us can continue making excuses for not sharing Christ with others, but the, the real question is, will those excuses be accepted? Do we not believe that people are really lost? Do we think that God will ex accept our flimsy excuses that we don't know enough? Folks, if we know enough to become a Christian, we know enough to share it with others. We know that sharing the good news is how the early church spread. It's very clear from Acts chapter 8, verse 4. When the persecution arose against the Jerusalem church, the disciples scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. They went everywhere evangelizing or announcing the good news of Jesus Christ. Now let's get back to our lesson this morning when pigs fly. Is this when we're going to start carrying out the Great Commission? When pigs fly. Is this when we're going to get serious about taking the gospel to our community? Or is it just something we simply refuse to do? Let's be honest. Is it, is it just something we simply say, I'm not going to do it, God? Let's go back to our text and pick up at verse 18. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. This man was grateful that he had been healed by Jesus of Nazareth. He wanted to get with Jesus, accompany him and follow him and be with the twelve. But Jesus had something else in mind for this man. Here was a man who was now in his right mind and Jesus had something for him to do. Verse 19. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And this man did what Jesus told him to do. Notice verse 20. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him, and all marveled. All of us have a different level of knowledge of Scripture. Some of us know more Scripture than others. Some are gifted with the ability to teach groups, whereas others are talented to teach one-on-one. -on -one. Others are very timid when speaking to a group, but they do well privately talking to an individual. But all of us who are Christians can tell our friends and our family what the Lord has done for us and how he has had compassion on us. Most of us can tell how the Lord has been long-suffering with us. How he's allowed us to make things right before it's too late. As we close this lesson this morning, I, I want to ask each one of you to read this verse with me. Verse 19. Read it with me. Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. Can't we all do that? Church, 
Let's not wait for pigs to fly or sweep down off of a cliff into a sea. Let's go home and tell our friends and our family what great things the Lord has done for us and how he had compassion on us. We all can tell that story, the story of Jesus and his love. The Great Commission, as recorded in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, applies to every one of us who is a disciple of Christ. We need to be evangelistic, and we can't afford to wait until pigs fly. If we're not going to be evangelistic, we need to remove our baptistries. You, we could use this space. We really could. We're always looking for storage place. I remember when we were looking to expand. Uh, you know, we were going to push this back. But it kept coming up. We need storage space. Need storage. Well, I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of storage space back there if we just remove that baptistry. If we're not going to be evangelistic, we need to take the baptistries out. Make better use of the space. As Gail and I toured through some cities in I Italy, we discovered that baptistries were often separate buildings from their churches. It's very interesting. For example, in Florence, in this beautiful cathedral with the huge red dome, to the right of the front entrance, down at the bottom right of the screen, uh, there's a square bell tower that stands up, but right across from the front door of the church is an octagonal building, beautiful octagonal building with, with bronze doors that have been gilded in gold. I mean, it is it's beautiful on the outside. Didn't get to go on the inside, but it's beautiful on the outside. Um, it opened in 1128 A.D., it's 11 centuries ago. Beautiful, beautiful marble. Just, just beautiful. It's the baptistry of St. John. It's beautiful on the outside. I don't know how beneficial that building is. But I want to show you one more. It's also called the baptistry of St. John, but it's the largest baptistry. It's the largest baptistry in all of Italy. It's the round building with the red dome, and yes, it leans also. It leans also. Not as much as the leaning tower, but it leans also. Construction on this was begun in 1152 A.D. It took them two centuries to complete it in 1363. I visited it 38 years ago. I was impressed then. We went in it, and the acoustics are perfect. As this young man uh, demonstrates in a little bit, um, this is the baptismal font, and then here's the man demonstrating the acoustics. You can make a sound, it reverberates, and then he can set another tone, and make it in harmony. That's how well the acoustics are. They just keep reverberating, and so he could actually sing a chord, uh, and, and you could hear the harmony. Just uh, amazing. Now, I know our baptistry is rather plain compared to these two, but is ours any more beneficial if it's not being used? As Justin comes on board, may I challenge us, the Walter Hill Church, to take the Great Commission more seriously. For us to be an evangelistic church, let's not make our baptistry a tourist attraction. Let's put it to work. Let's put it to use. That's what we as disciples of Christ should be doing. 
If you believe Jesus is the Son of God, won't you take the next step? Repent of your sins this morning as commanded in Acts 2.38. We'll take your confession and someone will immerse you into Christ in just a few minutes. And maybe you haven't been faithful as you should. I know we all fall short. We say that in prayers and we all fall short. But maybe we've fallen so short we're outside of God's grace and we need to do something about it. Whatever your need is this morning, the Lord can take care of it. If you need to respond anyway, won't you come? While together we stand and sing.